Good morning, everyone. My name is Jessica Pasinich, and I am an expedition leader on board several of UnCruise Adventures ships. Uh, I've been to lots of our destinations, and one of my favorite destinations to go to are, of course, the Hawaiian Islands. They're special for many, many, many reasons, but they have there some really interesting sea creatures that have very special reproductive habits. And by special, I mean interesting, fun to talk about. They create a great platform for talking about reproduction in the oceans, how important reproduction in the oceans is, and they just make for really good stories. So this presentation is called Hawaiian Love Stories, Interesting Reproductive Habits of the Deep. And it is about creatures that live in and among the Hawaiian waters in lots of different ecosystems there. So some of these creatures we're going to talk about today, um, we actually get to see on the trips that we, we do in Hawaii on the Safari Explorer. And then some of the creatures as well I chose intentionally because we don't get to see them. And I think this type of consciousness is really important when you go on big, huge adventures like the one that we do in Hawaii on the, on the Safari Explorer. So this type of adventure takes a stretching of the brain. You need to be able, of course, to understand and enjoy the critters that are right in front of you, but almost just as importantly, it takes imagination to imagine all of the rest of the creatures that are there with you as well, the ones that you don't have a hope at seeing. Because those creatures contribute to the ecosystem in ways that broaden our understanding of these places. They deepen our experience while we're there, and so I think it's great to mention them in presentations. So here we go, Hawaiian love stories, interesting reproductive habits of the deep. Again, my name is Jessica Pasinich, and this presentation started in my brain way back when in this. This picture is a picture of sea spawn. So in college, I worked aboard the Walton Smith which is a beautiful research vessel for the University of Miami, and we did countless studies in the Caribbean and the Florida Bay looking at reproductive habits of different fishes, looking, trying to find spawning grounds for billfish, um, taking lots of different studies, trying to figure out what, where the smallest of the small little fishes were going, where they were breeding, where they were spawning, lots of different uh, parameters, all in the hopes of trying to figure out this conundrum of reproduction in the ocean. You can imagine that in our oceans, this is a huge, huge job. And yet, as we'll talk about shortly, this is extremely important if we are going to understand and be good conservationists. So, this presentation was structured kind of in a funny way. I got word that there was this underground, undersea newspaper, I lovingly call it the Undersea Chronicler, where disgruntled sea creatures were writing in uh, to complain about their love lives. And so this presentation is structured uh, with their comments in mind. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through some um, basic material and then we're going to get into the love lives of these creatures. So if you're ready, here we go. I think it's good to understand that in the ocean there are so many different types of ecosystems that reproduction in the ocean really comes down to two things. Uh, these two governing principles they are not weighted equally. And so the two commandments of the sea, one of them might be don't get eaten, right? That would be a good commandment. Another one of them might be make sure to have lots of sex, pass on your genes, pass on your DNA. They do not exist in this order. In fact, it is far more important to make sure you have lots of sex to pass on all that DNA to future generations than it is to not get eaten. Yes, granted, you need to survive long enough not to get eaten so that you can have the sex and then get eaten, but that's the game in the ocean. It is far more advantageous to be able to do whatever it takes, employ any strategy, 
to be able to pass on your genes and contribute to the evolution of your species than it is to not get eaten. So you can do the deed and then you can get eaten. The way that we're going to look at these different strategies uh, are through the lens of each individual critter. So we'll begin with our first critter. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a little letter that that critter wrote in to the Undersea Chronicler and see if you can guess who this disgruntled sea creature might be. All right, ready? Dear Abby, you've got to help me. This long distance relationship is killing me. Every time I try to talk to my girl about it, she blows me off. I only get to see her once a year, and even then we only have one night together. I follow the magnetic highway thousands of miles just to see her. I finally find her in the mess of lesser females. We hook up at the top of the water column and twist together. It's heaven. But before I know it, we have fallen to the seafloor, and she pulls away without even a backward glance, never to be seen again. I feel unheard and underappreciated. How do I tell her? Hoping to hammer the message home, wide-eyed Harvey, the... Any guesses? Any guesses? Oh yes, there's Harvey. The hammerhead, Harvey the hammerhead. He's actually a scalloped hammerhead shark. Uh, we have these guys all throughout the Hawaiian waters. These are huge animals, huge, beautiful, long-lived, live-birthing, intelligent, nomadic creatures. And just like Harvey was complaining about in his letter to the Undersea Chronicler, his love life is pretty hard. So they can travel 10,000 miles in a season. They roam the ocean depths. They roam far and wide. Uh, we don't exactly know everywhere that we go. We've tracked them and tagged them. We study them constantly. Here's another picture of him. But we don't know the entirety of their life cycle and what they're doing and what they're up to. Uh, recent research has come across the following, and this is what is really interesting. So these guys roam the deep, and they do so uh, by a mechanism using magnetic attraction. You can see on the big front of his head here, this, this front is called his cephalofoil, and that's the big hammer shape on the front of a hammerhead shark. What you can't see in this picture are all the teeny tiny little pores that are all over the front of his cephalofoil. They're called ampullae of Lorenzini. And ampullae of Lorenzini are small sensory organs that detect magnetic fields. All different types of sharks use these ampullae of Lorenzini. However, scalloped hammerhead sharks have more of them. I, scientists think that that's why the shape of the cephalofoil is so wide, is to pepper more ampullae of Lorenzini across it. Because these guys are using what we think, this is our theory, the Earth's magnetic field to navigate, to find one another in order to mate. Yes, that's what we think is happening here. So all across his cephalofoil, he's got those ampullae of Lorenzini, and he is detecting magnetic highways that take him throughout our world's oceans, finally to previously agreed upon singles bars. Call them what you like. They're sea mounts out in the ocean. Uh, sea mounts disturb the prevailing currents. They, they cause upwelling, which brings nutrient-dense, oxygen-rich water from the depths up to the surface. It creates its own little ecosystem, starting all the way down from the smallest of plankton, and then bigger fishes come in, bigger, 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 to eat that lower down level. And then finally, we have this congregation of large critters at the top of the food chain. These guys come together on a predetermined date, at a predetermined spot, the, uh, the seamount of their choice, and they come together to breed. Look at that. Huge schools of them. Huge schools of hammerhead sharks. 
So just like Harvey was describing, they come together at the top of the water column. All of the females will be in close to the seamount, and the males come in from the outside. The females, the largest females, the ones who produce the most offspring, will be congregated in the center. And males like Harvey dash right to the center to try and mate with the largest female to try and pass on as much genetic material as they possibly can. They twine together at the top of the water column and they don't separate until they, their faces, their cephalofoils, almost hit the bottom of the ocean. And then it's tragic, just like Harvey was saying, they go their separate ways and they never see each other again. Now, the Hawaiian scalloped hammerheads come back to Hawaiian waters to pup. They give live birth and they can have a hundred live birth pups. Isn't that incredible? So when I learned about these sharks and how far they roam and how they come together using the Earth's magnetic fields we think to navigate, uh, I developed a brand new appreciation for their strategy of magnetic attraction. Let's see if we have some more photos of these guys. Oh yes, look at that one. How could you not love that face, right? So beautiful. All right, let's move on to strategy and critter number two. Is mauling a viable option? Let's see if it is. Dear Abby, my high school reunions are a disaster for gender equality. In some ways, we females have made great strides. I live the majority of my life on my own, traveling all the way down the Hawaiian islands, eating algae, sleeping between coral heads, and living peacefully. But when I entered my 30s and started traveling home, I began getting accosted by males. Not just one or two, but an entire armada. When I come home, I just want to kick up my flippers and relax, but I'm met by a flotilla of lusty contenders looking for the path. I need a break. Seriously suffering, Sandra the... Yes, Sandra the sea turtle. So in Hawaiian waters, we have several different types of sea turtles, but the one I want to talk about today, and the one that's near and dear to many Hawaiians' hearts, is the green sea turtle. Anybody know why she's called a green sea turtle? Any guesses, any guesses? A little trivia point. It's her fat that is green. So if you can imagine on the inside of her, all of her adipose tissue is green colored, hence the green sea turtle. These creatures are beloved of the ancient Hawaiians. They're traditional creatures. Many of them are amakua, which are personal or familial uh, ancestors or guardian spirits, so they are sacred. Their use and um, the practices involved with their shells uh, was highly guarded by the Aliki in the Hawaiian Islands of old, uh, but they were their skin and their their fat was rendered to make an ointment. Of course, their shells made several different decorative and ceremonial items. And then, of course, of course, people ate them as well. I'm told sea turtle is delicious. Nowadays, we don't eat them. They're protected. And that's because, as you'll see, their breeding, uh, the way that they mate is tricky. So we think that these sea turtles, there's Sandra, so beautiful, right? Look at that face. We think that these sea turtles use magnetic attraction as well, or some sort of form of it. So we think that perhaps they navigate back to their home waters using magnetic attraction and smell, some sort of mixture of both of those senses. But the life cycle of these turtles is quite interesting. So as babies, uh, they hatch from their home beach and they imprint at the moment that they hatch. They smell that sand and the smell of their home is so strong to them, they imprint it on their brain and they will come back to that beach to breed not every year but whenever it is that they are ready to breed and we'll talk about those factors uh, ready to mate they come back and lay their eggs on that very same beach so conservation of these critters is very very dependent on understanding the reproductive lifestyle so as small teeny tiny little 
turtles. They venture out into the ocean blue. We don't know what they do for about 10 years. Scientists are discovering this. Our knowledge in this area is getting better and better. But for a long time, we called these years the lost years because the tiny turtles would go out to sea and we wouldn't know what they were getting up to. Probably typical teenage shenanigans, but again, we don't know. And then sometime around 30 years of age, these sea turtles have become large enough, they've accumulated the nutrient density necessary in order to ovulate. And so these guys travel from the French frigate shoals. Here we go, we've got a map right there in the middle of this screen. You'll see the French frigate shoals. They are northwest of the Hawaiian Islands, a round trip trip from the Hawaiian Islands, from the Big Island to the French Frigate Shoals is around 800 miles. So at around 30, they collect the nutrient density that they need to ovulate. Their bodies start that process and the females start the long trip home to the very beach that they hatched from. So again, we think they use mag some sort of magnetic sense to navigate, and then we also think that they use smell when they get closer and closer. But not only is that journey the challenge, for one of the challenges for one of these, these turtles, or making it to 30 years in and of itself, that's a feat as well, right? Or accumulating all of that nutrient density. By the way, it could be 300 to 500 pounds of nutrient density just by eating algae and jellyfish. That's a challenge in and of itself, right? Uh, not only that, but when the females reach home, when they reach the French frigate shoals, they are met, like Sandra said, by a flotilla of lusty males. These males, of course, are trying to secure the best female, the largest female, the one with the most nutrient density so that she'll lay the most eggs with his DNA attached to them. Um, but as you can imagine, this is quite exhausting for the females. Uh, the females come home to their waters and there is a lot of courtship and jousting that takes place. Um, each male, like I said, wants to secure the fattest, healthiest females. And in order to do that, they jump on the females' backs. That's how they procreate. But not only do they, do they hang on to the females' backs, but they hang on for a very long time. They'll hang on until the female swims to shore to secure their DNA. They don't want anyone else to get a shot at this. So they hang on to the female until she gets to shore. This could take not a day or two days or three days. This can take up to two weeks. So again, these green sea turtles swim all the way home, 400 miles one way. And then they're met by the males who jump on their backs for a piggyback ride for about two weeks, up to two weeks. And, and the ladies haven't even laid their eggs yet. So they get to shore, they get to these beautiful sandy beaches. Look at that. This is a picture from the French Frigate Shoals. Uh, these are all protected areas in a marine park um, north of Hawaii. They get to shore here, and then they still have to dig a nest and lay their clutch. Oh, there we go. So they do this, they all come ashore, they dig this nest, and they'll lay up to a hundred eggs at a time. Now, they don't just lay eggs once a year or once a breeding season, they lay them three to six times. So the females will travel all this way, they'll undergo their strange mating ritual, and then they'll do it up to six times in an entire season. It depends on how much nutrients um, she has stockpiled within her body. Isn't that incredible though? There are all those little eggs, but it's all worth it. All of this effort, all of this toil, all of this gender inequality, if you will, because that's the end result. And I don't know that there's anything cuter than that. I mean, look at those guys. And they make it back out to sea and they start the cycle all over again. Before they leave though, they imprint that scent uh, of their home beach so that they can always return to that beach and we start their life cycle over. Incredible critters, yes? All right, we'll move on to strategy and critter number three. Simply drug your spouse. Dear Abby, let's see if you can get this, guess this one. Dear Abby, 
My love life is great, okay? I am not complaining. I get all the ladies. They're breaking down the door to get into my love den, and let's be honest, who could resist all these hairy legs and antenna? It's just that sometimes I don't remember inviting the ladies in. You know, come to think of it, I don't even remember meeting them or falling for them or even the act of love. All that is a dim haze. What I do remember every time is the sight of her moving out after we've mated. She seems happy with, well, you know, but shouldn't I be too? Is it possible I'm being roofied under my own roof? Trying not to get my claws all up in a twist, Ludlow the, yes, Ludlow the lobster. So in Hawaii, we have several different types of lobsters. And as you can imagine, all different species have their own little quirky mating rituals. Uh, but we're going to generalize here and talk about them in general. And we'll talk about their anatomy and their strategy uh, because it's similar across the board. Not exactly the same, but similar. This is the Hawaiian slipper lobster. We also have uh, red spiny lobsters and reef lobsters. But this guy is a slipper lobster. Look how beautiful he is. Oh, look at that face. The lure of a good love potion. <coughs> so that's part of this strategy here. Uh, lobsters are A plus potion masters. So the lobster story begins with the males. The males are like uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde creatures. They are extremely aggressive and they battle with one another for not, even before the females come on stage, the males are battling with one another. They do this in order to develop a very particular scent that the females are attracted to, or we think. This is the theory. We observe these things in the wild and then we make deductions. The deductions might not be correct, but I'll just tell you what we think is going on. So let's talk a little bit about the behavior. Oh, look at that beautiful guy. Aren't they exquisite? So we'll start here with Ludlow. Ludlow has chosen the most gorgeous reef crevice to call home, but next door, just down the road, is another lobster which has another reef crevice, and another one next to him, and another one next to him, and another one next to him, and you would think they could live in harmony, but they don't because Ludlow is a bully. Ludlow will go to his neighbor's uh, crevice. I think of these little crevices as like 1970s love vans. What were those called? Shag, shag dens, shag vans, where you've got the little fringe hanging in the car and the carpet, and I think of them like that. So Ludlow's got his little love den, but he's not satisfied with that. He has to go and bug his neighbor. He runs up to his neighbor and he knocks on the door. The guy comes to the door and he pees in his face. Then they both urinate on each other and they duke it out. They fight over this crevice. We don't know what the parameters of a good crevice are. We actually don't think that this fighting behavior is over territory. We think it's over dominance of, a, of an entire territory, an entire population of lobsters. So they'll fight, they'll duke it out, one of the lobsters will win, one will tuck tail and run. That guy, the one who won, um, we'll call him Ludlow for now, he goes in, he'll hang out in that little lobster crevice, that little shag van, he'll hang out for a little while, he'll pee, he'll spread his scent around, and then he'll get bored and move on to the next one. He moves on to the next one, and on to the next one, and on to the next one, after he's accumulated a series of wins. He's quite the bully. At the end of the street, after he's won against all the lobsters, a miraculous thing has taken place. His urine, they've been peeing on each other this whole time, his urine, the chemical signature within, has actually changed. It has changed from untested and but cocky, to full-blown, I am the Hulk, I am the biggest badass on this block. Now, that scent at the end of all of this fighting is what attracts the females, and the females are watching. They're watching and waiting for this chemical signature. They do this because, of course, they want the biggest and the baddest and the strongest in order to pass on their genes, but they have arsenal of their own. So, female lobster, interstate right, 
she has an interesting conundrum. She wants the biggest, baddest Hulk, who has the largest temper, extremely aggressive, probably passive aggressive. Uh, but at the same time, in order to mate, she has to molt first. Lobsters, female lobsters, have a little pouch under their tail that they store sperm in. And every time they want to fertilize their eggs, they need a fresh patch of freshly donated sperm from a male. In order for that sperm to be fresh, they have to have recently molted. Now, <clears throat> molting renders female lobsters virtually powerless. Uh, they shed that hard carapace, their outer armor, and they are so soft, their outer skin is so soft, that for up, for third, up to 30 minutes, they can't even stand under their own weight. That's how delicate they are. And it'll take another several days for that shell, that carapace, to harden back to its normal body armor hardness. So, the females have a conundrum here. They want the biggest hulk, but they're very vulnerable. What do they do? they drug him. Yes, the females drug their spouses. So after they've chosen the biggest badass on the block, they will walk up to his love den. They'll knock on the door. He comes to the door. Sometimes he'll get a swat in. He's so aggressive. But usually, she pees him in the face and runs away. So she urinates all over the entrance to his love den, right in his face, and then she runs away. He won't leave his love den. He's protecting that spot that he's fought for. So he goes back in. She will do this day after day after day after day. After about <clears throat> four or five days, he is completely in love with her. This is a very powerful chemical warfare going on here between them. He's so in love with her scent after four days that she can approach and he will not attack her. That's when they move in together. So she'll move in. She's still testing him. They don't mate right away. They might get to first or second base. They pet each other with their legs. They have teeny tiny hairs all down the front of their legs with tasting organs on them. So the heavy petting ensues and they're actually tasting each other's feet. Kinky stuff, right? Uh, of course, they're urinating this whole time, just bathing each other in this evidently very sensual cocktail, this perfume of love. Uh, a note, actually, about the anatomy that enables this. Lobsters have very strange anatomy. In their brains, they have a urine sac, and that's where the majority of the urine comes from. Um, this urine is held in little sacs under the eyeballs, right here in the front, under the eyeballs, and lobsters actually pee forward. They shoot it forward. And not only that, but they shoot it forward with such uh, pressure that if you were a lobster um, and you were standing at the back of a school bus and you peed forward, you could shoot your urine so far forward that it would hit the front of the school bus. That's the analogy for lobsters. It's up to seven of their body lengths away. That's an incredible feat. Okay, back to the story. So they're peeing on each other. They're touching each other on their hairy legs. And finally, when she has judged that he is docile enough, he's not going to rip her head off, she disrobes for him. Ah ha ha. There we are. This is not a Hawaiian lobster, but I thought this was a really good representation of our demure lady lobster who, have just, who has just disrobed for her gentleman. And at this point, after she sheds her shell, remember, she is so delicate. He gently flips her over, and they actually mate face to face, and then he will guard her for several days afterwards until her shell hardens and she can be on her merry way. So let's talk about our next strategy, strategy four. And our next critter who employs this strategy, can you just handcraft the perfect husband? Is that what we could do? Let's see. Dear Abby, I feel guilty even writing this. I love my wife very much. I will never leave her. If she gets sick, I will stay by her side until she recovers, and she would do the same for me, right? The problem is, I'm just so stressed out 
My wife expects me to do everything. I have to court her, dance for her, flash colors for her, and then I have to carry our children to term. She stays by my side through the entire pregnancy, but sometimes I get the feeling that she's only doing it to keep an eye on the kids. I used to think it was because she was worried about me, that she cared, but now I'm not so sure. Used and abused, Seymour the... Any guesses? Any guesses? Seymour the seahorse. The story can also be called the allure of a doting husband. The strategy employed by seahorses is fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. And it's driven by an interesting physiological need that the females have. And I imagine uh, that several of these species, if not all of these species, are driven by unique, their strategies are adapted to unique physiological needs, just like the seahorse. And so when we're talking about seahorses, we have to first start with the fact that they are monogamous. They're monogamous in the wild. Uh, in captivity, not so much because they have any partner they want, but it's very hard to find partners for seahorses. They don't have really huge wide rain home ranges. They, um, they're not the greatest swimmers. They're, one of their strategies in order not to get eaten is to be pretty incognito. So they have a hard time finding the singles bar, and maybe that contributes to the fact that they are monogamous. They will not leave one another unless one dies or gets sick. They'll stay, and that's because, as you'll see, as we're going to talk about, they invest a huge amount of time in the relationship, getting to know one another, courting one another, having hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of children together. This is the story of the seahorse. So in Hawaii, we have two species of seahorse. Uh, by the way, this is not a very well-studied area. If anyone is looking for research projects, uh, the Hawaiian seahorse is definitely an area where um, study is needed. But we do know that we have Hippocampus cuda, and that's these sweet little guys. They can be up to about eight or nine inches long, we think. They live at the confluence of rivers and the ocean. Um, these are one of those critters that you think you might see in Hawaii, and we never do. I never have. I've never seen one in the wild. That's how elusive they are. We also have an even more elusive species called Hippocampus fishery. Now, there's a lot of debate about whether these guys are their own species or whether there's an endemic version of them, the Hawaiian Hippocampus fishery. Um, there's a great organization that does research into this called Ocean Rider Seahorse Farms. It's on the Kona Coast um, in the aquaculture facility there. So if you'd like more information, I would like to invite you to visit their website. But as of right now, we think we've got these two species. One of them is coastal and another one of them is open ocean pelagic. That's these guys, these fishery guys. But whether they're open ocean pelagic or coastal, they employ the same strategy. Now that strategy is spending a lot of time to find the perfect mate. They are interviewing their, the dads, the females are. So what happens is, is that a male and a female seahorse will come across one another and they will try and impress one another. They embark on a courtship dance. They'll flash their colors at one another. The male will inflate his belly and deflate his belly for her. She loves a male with a big beer belly. So the bigger the belly, the more uh, impressed she is. And they'll both sort of dance around one another. And then they do this every morning for four, five days, two weeks, deciding if they like each other enough to finally mate. Once they've made that decision, they'll hook tails, they'll stroll along the sandy bottom promenade. I'm not making this up, I'm not anthropomorphizing, this is actually what they do, it's really quite touching. Uh, and then, when she has judged, when the female has judged that he's ready, judged that he's the one, that he'll be very committed to her, and once her eggs are ready, she actually deposits her eggs into his pouch. And the eggs are internally fertilized inside the male body. 
To my knowledge, this is the only creature in the animal kingdom that actually has true male internal fertilization. Uh, there are several other different types of fish where the males play the majority of the caretaking role. There are lots of fish where males collect their babies in their mouth right after they hatch to sort of take care of them until they're large enough to go out into the population, but nothing is quite the same as this male role in the fish world. So this male remains pregnant. Let's see if we have photos of him. See that fleshy pouch of the seahorse there? This is not a Hawaiian species of seahorse right here, uh, but I wanted to show this slide so that you could see these bellies. Now, the seahorse in the center of the frame there, all the way up at the top, that fee that's a female. See her nice little tucked belly? That's her. She's the one with the six pack in this species. And surrounding her are three pregnant males. See their huge distended bellies? So she impregnates her husband, and then they continue their morning courtship. They go their separate ways in the evenings. They have their own rooms or houses or however you want to think about it. And then they come back together every morning, and they'll resume their courtship. And she is actually checking up on him. You might think that this is sweet or she does it out of love, or care for him, or even care for her lifelong partner, who knows? And maybe all those things are true. But one thing that we do know is that she's gauging his readiness to give birth. And she does that for a very specific reason. So over time, these seahorses give live birth the males give live birth. See those little babies coming out of the pouch? He'll go into a jackknife position. Um, birth for Hippocampus cuda takes about four hours, um, and they can have up to 1,500 babies. Isn't that incredible? Look at that. So the males give birth, and that's the extent of this parental care over their, their offspring. Because, remember I told you that the female is always watching the male, gauging the uh, progression of his pregnancy? She does this for a very specific reason, and that reason is that right after he gives birth, she's timing her eggs, which are growing in her own body, she's timing them perfectly for him to be impregnated again, sometimes the very same day, right after he gives birth, yes. So for an entire season of mating, the male in the husband-wife relationship will stay pregnant. And that's the reality of seahorse sex. Incredible, huh? Strategy five and critter number five, embracing your inner bully. This is a good one. Ready? Dear Abby, I am a terrible mate. I just can't seem to fall for the nice guys. You know, the ones who take the time to build their own nests out of seaweed. The ones who go through the painstaking process of being vetted as a good dad by the other females. That's the guy I should want to hook up with, right? The one who I know will be there to watch over my eggs until they've hatched. The one who will starve himself and only succumb to snacking on a few of those eggs while he stands guard. That should be the guy for me, but no. I have to fall for the bad boys every time. Abby, what does that say about me as a fish? In love with his no good dirty ass, Wanda, the... Any guesses? Any guesses? The Rass. Yes! Wanda the Rass. This story is called The Good Provider and the No Good Dirty Rastard. So, Again, in Hawaii, we have several different species of rats. They are beautiful, colorful, gorgeous fishes. Uh, the blue and yellow ones are these famous cleaner rats that come along and, and feed off of the little teeny tiny parasites and critters that live on the back of sea turtle shells. Uh, and of course, as you can imagine, they all employ different strategies, but most rats use some sort of version on the following. Now, Another strategy in the ocean is to, of a female, is to vet your male in some way, right? 
And usually a lot of fish species do this by size, coloration, as we saw with lobsters, although they're not fish, as we saw with lobsters, uh, the females vet their males through aggression, watching to see who's the most aggressive. It's actually the opposite in wrasse species. So the male wrasses build nests. There's one, can you see that? <laughs> Wanted, family friendly home in a good neighborhood. The females are actually looking for really good homemakers, really good dads who take the time to build the squishiest, softest nest out of seaweed. Look at those nests, aren't they gorgeous? Uh, the females are looking for these types of males because the females actually don't play any role in watching over their eggs or tending to the eggs at all. That is all the male's purview. So the females come along, they'll find a male wrasse with a beautiful nest, they'll judge him on certain criteria, who knows what they are about the nest, but they also judge him based on something else. Uh, they actually, the females, want a dad who's already been vetted by other females. They're looking not only for a nest, but a nest that has eggs in it. Yeah because the females are going to just lay the rest of their eggs in that nest as well, and then they're going to hightail it out of there. They're going to be gone. They don't stick around to see if their kids look like them. Uh, they don't stick around for any reason. So we think that the females are judging a nest based on some sort of criteria, but also judging the husband on whether another female has vetted him as a good dad because it is part of that male's job to guard over those eggs. So the female comes along, she lays her eggs in his beautiful nest, and she gets, she skedaddles, she's out of there. It's the male who watches over the eggs and defends them against predation by all sorts of other critters. Eggs are, by necessity, very nutritious food. Um, and the males do this without eating, without leaving the nest, but sometimes they do get hungry and they need a little late night snack. That late night snacking is maybe one of the reasons that females lay their eggs in a nest that already has eggs, because if you think about it, if you lay your eggs in a nest that's already filled with eggs, and that male couple nights, two, three, four nights uh, during the Friends Marathon gets hungry but can't leave the nest, he's going to munch on a couple of them. And if there are eggs already in that nest, then it's a good chance that perhaps the eggs that he's munching on aren't yours, but the female who came around before you. So we think that those are the strategies for egg laying and nesting. And the males stay there until the eggs have hatched and the fry go on their way. That wouldn't be terribly um, unusual, except for there's another behavior tucked in here as well. So this other behavior is that not all males are created equal. There are good, loving, dutiful dads who do their duty and stay on the nest, but there are bullies who take a shortcut. These guys hang in the wings, probably over there in the seaweed or behind that big rock somewhere. They wait for a female to come along. They watch another male build a nest. They're sitting around probably eating Cheetos. They do none of the work. They don't build their own nests. They watch and wait for the females to come around and lay eggs in a big, beautiful nest. They watch and wait for the female to swim away. And then they swoop in, kick the other wrasse off the nest, and fertilize the eggs before he gets a chance to. Isn't that sad? He'll, he'll sit there for a little while, look left, look right, and then of course, yes, he gets bored and he leaves that nest. He does this, he abandons his own young because he knows that that sweet original wrasse daddy was waiting in the wings and he'll swim on back and he'll sit on that nest even though he didn't fertilize any of those eggs. None of those little baby wrasses are going to look like him. He's the good dad. And that's the strategy of wrasse fishes. Some of those good dads get lucky and actually pass on their genetic material, but the majority of them, of those nests, are actually fertilized by the big bully pirate males waiting in the wings. Crazy, huh? All right, strategy six. Okay. 
at this point, I like to check in uh, with all of my viewers because up until now, these strategies have been a little weird, right? A little out there, but our next couple of strategies are really out there. So I just like to check in, see how everybody's doing, doing okay? All right, we'll press on. Uh, this critter in this strategy, as you can see, employs mass manufacture of their body parts. <laughs> see if we could do this, right? See if we can stomach hearing about it. All right, ready? Dear Abby, my love life has gotten so boring. Nothing is new, nothing's exciting. My life is an endless slither along the seafloor. Even when I find a mate, it's always the same. Well, I guess it has to be. We're exactly the same, we have the same body parts. But I want something new and exciting. I want to see something I haven't seen before. And not only that, but can't the act of love not end in dismemberment for both of us? Is that even normal? Dreaming of a better life, Newton the Nudabrank. <laughs> oh, he's so handsome. This is Goiniobrachus reticulata. And just like all the other species we've been talking about, Goiniobrachus reticulata, doesn't that sound like a Harry Potter spell? Uh, he has very specific strategies that are not necessarily indicative of all Nudabranks. However, we're going to talk about him because he has really, really extreme love life. Uh, this story is titled, Love Em and Leave Em, and it's not what you think. So the interesting thing about these nudibranchs, a nudibranch is a type of sea slug. Um, I'm sure that that's not extremely technical, but for those of you out there who aren't extremely technical, uh, they're shellless slugs or snails slithering out at the bottom of the ocean. If you haven't seen images of these creatures, please, please Google nudibranchs because they are stunning creatures that take all sorts of forms. Their colors are absolutely mesmerizing. They are true Picassos of the ocean. So definitely look into that if you're not familiar with these critters. Uh, we actually see nudibranchs in Hawaii sometimes and they're a rare sight, but it's really special when we do. Oh, these guys are so pretty. Look at that. <laughs> this is them actually in the act of hooking up. So these nudibranchs are reciprocating hermaphrodites. That means that both critters, all of them, have male and female body parts, and they actually have sex with one another at the same time. So they hook up and they inseminate each other at the exact same time. Um, that's pretty common for a lot of slug species, even our terrestrial beloved banana slugs in Alaska. They employ a similar strategy. That's not what makes these guys special. Uh, what happens next is what makes these guys special. So these critters, um, the penis comes in and hooks into the other, the reciprocal part of the nudibranch, the receiving nudibranch. And the penises of these guys, the heads, are covered in backward-facing barbs. So this penis goes in and gets stuck. Uh, one of the theories, we don't know how much weight this actually holds, but one of the theories is that um, that backward-facing barb structure actually acts like Velcro and scrapes out the semen of previous suitors. Who knows? Who knows if that's um, actually what's happening, that's a theory. But anyway, they engage in the act of love, so romantic, and then they can't pull apart because of these barbs on the penis. And they will stretch and stretch and stretch and stretch some more as they slither away from one another until finally they rip or tear apart and the, uh, the body part is, is is distended, destroyed beyond measure, um, and it can't be used again. So this poor body part is sort of like flopping along behind the, the nudibranch as he, um, as he roams the deep, and he can't use it again, so he drops it, and he leaves his penis behind. And he can do this because of one incredible adaptation. He can grow another one. And he does. In fact, he has a, 
a conveyor belt of penises in the ready. And he regrows it every time and he's ready for action again. He, she, both of them, they're hermaphrodites. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that? Number one, could you endure an act of love that is that uh, extreme and violent? Number two, could you part with your body part shortly after? And number three, could you regrow your own again? <laughs> it's just, they're, um, they're like incredible aliens, these guys. Going to Obracus Reticulata. All right, strategy number seven. <sighs> this is by, by far uh, my favorite. I don't know what that says about me, but strategy number seven, give it your all, body and soul. Are you ready? Dear Abby, my husband is so clingy. Come to think of it, all of them are. Sometimes I wish I could just have my own space. Is that wrong? It might be nice to spend a quiet night with my girlfriends watching vampire movies and eating popcorn shrimp. Every one of my husbands is a drain on my resources. They don't hunt, they don't clean, they don't even talk to me. Well, I guess they can't, but it doesn't matter. I know they find my blink irresistible, my fleshy bosom undeniable, but I want more. I want more than just a sperm donation in the form of a lifelong freeloader. You know what I want to tell them all? Swim back inside your mama's egg sack. Doom to the gloom. Angela, the... This story is called The Dwarf and the Dominatrix, by the way. Angela, the... <laughs> anglerfish. Yes, that's right. Deep sea anglerfishes. She is so beautiful. Don't make fun of her. She can't help what she looks like. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Oh, how could you not love that face? That's an incredible face. These critters might have one of the most drastic love lives that I have ever read about. And it's drastic because they live in extreme conditions. So these critters live 13,000 feet down in the deep abyssal plains of the oceans that surround the Hawaiian Islands. We will never see them. In fact, no one sees them except the folks who go down or send down rovers into the deep, deep sea. This is the area of the ocean where no light penetrates. Uh, this is the area of the ocean that's under such intense pressures that it would, it would absolutely decimate the human body. Um, there's no light here to speak of. It's incredible. It's cold, it's deep, uh, but it's not devoid of life. As you can see, there are incredible critters that live here, and these anglerfishes are just one of them. So their life cycle starts, of course, like all little fishes, uh, as fry. And we're gonna talk about the males first because they're quite mighty little guys. The males, are born attached to their egg sac and they carry around their egg sac with them. These epitomize, these fish epitomize that rule that we were talking about at the very beginning of the presentation, thou must procreate by any and all means necessary. So these guys are born with one mission and that is to find the love of their life, to seek out their female, they are not born with any ability to hunt or feed themselves or evade predation or do anything but search for their lady and search they do so they're born with their egg sac still attached and they'll eat off that egg sac until it has run dry and after it runs dry and they haven't found their women their lady they die so what's the percentage of males that you think maybe never find a female partner? 1%, 2%, 3%? It's about one in a thousand that actually finds a mate. We think it's very difficult to do research at this level of the ocean, as you can imagine, at this depth. So this male, one in a thousand, he will seek out his lady. He has very specific organs that enable him to do this, and those are the largest nostrils in the animal kingdom compared to head size. Yes, the males of this species have the biggest nose holes of any critter living on the earth. So they use these nose holes to smell her out. They can smell their lady. 
So they seek her out using scents until they get close enough to see her blinking lure. Let's see if we can see that lure up top on the head. That little blinking bit emits light in a very particular color and pattern. There are about 165 different species of anglerfish, and each one has a specific color and blinking pattern so that those young males, they know the pattern that they're looking for, they can find the right female in the doom and gloom. And they do. If a male, well, one in a thousand, one, it's either one, it's like one to a hundred or one to a thousand, we think. Uh, if that male finds his lady love, do they have an elaborate courtship ritual? No. Do they have a long-standing love affair? No. He swims right up to her and he bites onto her fleshy belly. And, oh look, so see there's the male anglerfish biting on the fleshy belly of the female. And you might think that that would be painful or harmful or, oh, that poor female anglerfish, she gets bitten by the male. But what happens next is uh, the ultimate retri retribution, retaliation. The male's jaw affixes to her belly and it immediately begins to disintegrate. His throat begins to disintegrate. Her blood vessels and her vascular structure goes down his throat and into his body, and she takes over his body. Uh, all essential functions for him stop. He stops breathing. He stops thinking. He stops eating. She feeds him. She takes care of everything, every aspect of his life. Yes, even the act of love. So when she is ready, she controls when he inseminates and fertilizes her eggs. Isn't that incredible? Uh, she'll use him in this way until she doesn't need him anymore, and then he dies or he runs out of sperm, and then he dies and he falls away. A female anglerfish can collect, ooh, look at that, look at that bite. This guy found his lady with some egg sac still attached. A female anglerfish can have two, three, four males attached to her at once, and she uses them as she sees fit. Look at that. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? Um, the females live to be, we think, about 30 years of age, and so of course she'll collect lots of zombie husbands throughout her life. So we'll probably have several, if she's lucky, zombie husbands. And the reason that this is an incredible strategy is because, as you can imagine, in the deep, in an environment like that, the resources are so limited. It's hard to find one another. There's not a lot of food. There's not a lot of light. So why divvy up the resources between both sexes? Why not specialize? And that's exactly what these guys do. And in doing so, it seems to me that their specialization is what ensures their success. If you have one thing to do and your the entirety of your physiology is helping you achieve that thing, so the large nostrils, the egg yolk, the small body size, the, the no need to find their own food, if you have one mission, then you're more likely to achieve that one mission. And on the female side, she has one mission as well. She's not going out finding mates, the mates are finding her. She's feeding herself and producing offspring. And so through specialization, you have success. They're incredible creatures, even though uh, their story is a little scary, morbid, terrifying, fascinating. So what's the point of all of this, my friends? Why do we care about this kinky stuff? So aside from the entertainment value, Aside from how interesting it is scientifically, uh, food security is a real thing. Food security, conservation, if we have any hope, any hope at all of successfully managing our oceans, then we have got to understand reproduction. We can't just understand and protect habitat. We have to understand the cycles and the needs and the strategies that govern a viable population extending into the future. Number one, we have to do this 
for the fish in the oceans themselves. And number two, we have to do this for us as well, for humanity, because food security depends on it. There are a billion, yes, one billion people that depend on fish for their livelihoods and for all of their food. So not just, oh, I'd like to have salmon for dinner on Sunday night, but no, I eat and survive off of fish. One billion people. Another aspect of the importance of understanding reproduction is for human health. There are a myriad of medicines that come from the oceans, especially from reefs. Uh, this is a picture of um, sea urchins. And by studying sea urchins and their sexual reproductive habits, um, we developed in vitro fertilization. Yes, that entire technology, hundreds of thousands of people who are alive on the planet today owe their very existence to the humble sea urchin. It was by studying them that we, that we developed in vitro fertilization. Also, horseshoe crabs, uh, their blood is used in, to um, facilitate the detection of bacterial endotoxins, which can coat surgical instruments. And so if you've ever had a surgery in a hospital, then you quite possibly owe your life to horseshoe crab blood. Yes, and those are just two examples of the ways in which we use ocean critters in order to stay healthy and develop, uh, to develop scientific uh, protocols that help us in that regard. So the science and the learning that's out there regarding reproduction is incredible. We have so much more to learn. These critters also filter our water for us. An oyster can clean 50 gallons of water a day. Uh, an acre of oyster reef filters up to 36 Olympic swimming pools of water a day. That is significant, my friends. Their shells also build berms that protect us from sea level rise and storm surge. We depend on these creatures, and so we have to understand their reproductive habits. In short, without sex in the sea, we are sunk. And so, myself, these are fun exciting things to talk about, and it broadens our understanding, but at the end of the day, we've got to understand these mechanisms so that we can make informed conservation decisions, so that the viability of the fish populations and the life in the oceans alongside human life can develop in a healthy, sustainable way into the future. One more note I'd like to make about this presentation is that this information is based on this book. If you liked this presentation, please, please read this book, Sex in the Sea by Mara J. Hart. She's an incredible scientist. Uh, my information came mostly from her. There are some other sources as well, but her book is informative and fun and it's laugh out loud and it includes all sorts of critters, not just Hawaiian critters. Um, and it's, it's a really good read. So I appreciate you spending the time with me today. This is always really fun to do. Please come with us to Hawaii on the Safari Explorer. Um, it is a trip unlike any other. You might just get to see some of these kinky critters out there. Thank you, everyone. Be safe. <laughs>